today I'm comparing the 16-inch M1 Max to the original 13-inch M1 specifically for photo editing. I'll be doing processing and export tests in Lightroom, browsing speed tests, tests in Photoshop, as well as a few other general tests. The fastest M1 laptop versus the slowest. Do you really need to spend 3,500 US dollars or can you get decent performance only spending 1,300? By the way, here are the full specs for each Mac. The M1 Max has way more GPU cores and RAM than the M1. First test is seeing how smooth each Mac can browse through photos. Using photos taken with the Sony A7S III, which has 12 megapixels and 25 megabyte photos, shuffling through RAW photos isn't super smooth on the M1, taking approximately 667 milliseconds to flip between photos, while the M1 Max flips between pics without delay. For PNG versions of the photos, the M1 reduces load time to 417 milliseconds, but now the M1 Max strangely takes 333 milliseconds to preview the next photo. The last and easiest file format to process, JPEG, shuffles stutter-free through the photos on the M1 right away. But during the first pass of photos on the M1 Max, it's actually pretty laggy. However, when all images have been viewed once, subsequent shuffles through the photos is back to being delay-free. I tried this round of tests with the Nikon D780, which has double the megapixels at 24 and 28 megabyte photos. For RAW, both the M1 Max and the M1 take 833 milliseconds. For PNG, they both take 667 milliseconds. And lastly, for JPEG, the same thing happened as in the first example. The M1 previewed without delay right away, but on the M1 Max, it was stuttery previewing the photos for the first time and completely smooth after. Next round of tests is in Lightroom. The first one being copy and paste test to see how long it takes to paste effects. Using the Sony A7S III and pasting effects to 77 photos, it took the M1 Max 1.57 seconds and the M1 1.74 seconds. Basically the same and honestly probably not even worth testing, but I did want to try it with the Nikon D780 and way more photos. This time pasting effects to 409 photos, the M1 Max took 2.35 seconds and the M1 2.7 seconds to paste effects. Moving on to exporting tests in Lightroom. I used the same group of photos from the previous example and exported first in PNG and then in JPEG and oh my goodness, things were painfully slower. Exporting to PNG, the Sony A7S III's 77 photos took the M1 Max 6 minutes and 2 seconds, or 6.03 minutes, while the M1 was just behind at 6.52 minutes. Exporting to the much more compressed JPEG format took the M1 Max only 46 seconds and the M1 1.15 minutes. Turning up the testing difficulty level and exporting 409 Nikon D780 photos to PNG took the M1 Max a staggering 1 hour, 35 minutes, and 34 seconds, while the M1 was once again right behind at 1 hour, 40 minutes, and 55 seconds. It's insane how much faster JPEGs are able to process because the same round of photos was 20 times faster for the M1 Max at 5.55 minutes, and the M1 was only 10 times faster at 9.17 minutes to export to JPEG. M1 Max unfortunately really isn't anything super special so far. For the next round of tests, we're in Photoshop. I wanted to test smoothness because there's nothing worse than working on a photo and your computer lagging after each input. After using Photoshop for a couple years on a few different Macs, I've noticed that lagginess would happen most often when masking and isolating areas by hand. Comparing the M1 Max to the M1 using a raw photo from the D780, both are pretty smooth, but the M1 Max looks to be the better of the two. Using a PNG photo from the A7S III, I'd say they're both equally smooth. This is pretty impressive as the expensive Intel iMacs I've used in the past have always had a second or two delay after each input. Next I tested how fast time lapses would render and export in Photoshop. Using the sunrise time lapse consisting of 409 photos in PNG and shot with the D780, it took the M1 Max 3.45 minutes to render and 3.48 minutes to export while the M1 was also 3.45 minutes to render, but was slower in the export at 4.22 minutes. I did notice, however, that the M1 could not hold a render as shown by this green line. So when I tried to play the time lapse again on the M1 once it had been supposedly rendered, it would once again play back at only a few frames per second. 
Conversely, on the M1 Max, you can see that the green bar covers the whole sequence, and after it renders, it plays back in my desired 24 frames per second. Testing the same group of photos but in JPEG was a little bit quicker. The M1 Max rendered the 409 photo time lapse in 2.5 minutes and export in 3.12 minutes, while the M1 took 2.65 minutes for render and 3.65 minutes for export. The M1 couldn't hold the render for JPEG format either. The last few tests I wanted to run aren't photo related, but I thought they were worth knowing about. First one is transfer speeds of downloading a 100 gigabyte file off an SSD and then back onto the SSD. The file is a mix of 568 photos and videos and 100.28 gigabytes of data to be exact. Downloading the file off the SSD onto the M1s was the same for both Macs, coming in at 4.27 minutes, but transferring the same file from the M1s onto the SSD was a little bit faster on the M1 Max, taking 5.25 minutes, and the M1 was 5.47 minutes. And lastly, I just wanted to quickly discuss video editing on these laptops. I've already uploaded a separate video linked here and down below where I extensively run only real world tests on both the M1 Max and the M1. So I won't discuss any of those results here. But something I didn't go into in those videos is that I found some Apple screens are able to actually see more detail in the highlights of an image, while other Mac screens blow out those details. Looking at this image, you probably can't see very much detail in these clouds. The whites are blown out removing that detail. But when looking at the scopes, you can see that there is no sharp cutoff like you'd expect when whites are truly overexposed and blown out. If I bring down the highlights, you should now see significantly more detail in the clouds than you could previously. On my Intel iMac, I'm actually able to see those details in the clouds before I drop the highlights below 100 luma. So for me, I could see the exact same amount of detail in those clouds before and after I brought down the highlights. Testing this out on the M1, I cannot see those details above 100 luma and they only become visible on the screen once I bring down the highlights. Trying the same thing for the M1 Max, the same thing occurs, which was surprising because the panel on the M1 Max is probably the best one Apple has released so far. But the rule of thumb anyways is to keep your highlights below 100 luma so that when you're sharing your videos on other screens or other platforms, those details aren't lost no matter what. So is the M1 Max necessary for photo editing? Well, based off these results, it's quite clear it really doesn't perform that much better than the base M1 which is obviously great news. Maybe all those extra cores make a difference when video editing. If you're curious, be sure to check that video out as well as some of my other performance comparisons. I've tested the M1 Max, the M1, the M1 Pro, and my fully spec'd out 2020 Intel iMac. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day.